ever found yourself staring at a flickering light, a laptop that stubbornly decided to play dead, or a cake that's just, well, flopped, and you've thought, seriously, why? Here's a little secret. In that very moment of frustration, you're actually tapping into one of the most powerful problem-solving tools ever created. And chances are, you use it multiple times a day without even a second thought. Stick around because you're about to meet the inner scientist you never knew you had. The everyday mysteries and the complex giant we all bump into them, right? Those little puzzles, and sometimes not so little ones, that life tosses our way. Why won't this pen write suddenly? Why is my internet crawling at a snail's pace? Today, of all days. Then you think about actual scientists, the folks in white coats in those high-tech labs, and wonder how they even start to tackle huge mysteries like curing diseases or figuring out the universe. It can feel like there's a massive gap between our day-to-day -day troubleshooting and their world-changing discoveries. We often picture the scientific method as this super rigid, complicated thing that belongs in textbooks, not on our kitchen counters next to a misbehaving remote control. But is that really true? Agitate. The untapped power within you hears a thought. What if that feeling of a huge gap is mostly in our heads? What if the basic ideas that lead to Nobel Prizes are pretty much the exact same ones that help you figure out why your coffee tastes a bit off or why your favorite plant is looking droopy? So many of us go through life not even realizing we have this amazing mental toolkit, this systematic way of thinking that can untangle problems, big or small. We might see the scientific method as something you just learn for a test, not something you actually live by. But by not recognizing it, we're missing out on using a fundamental human skill. It's like having a superpower for clear thinking and finding solutions, but never knowing it's there. Imagine the problems you could solve, or the decisions you could make with way more confidence, if you knew how to consciously use this power. The solve, unveiling your inner scientist with the scientific method, all right? Let's pull back the curtain. That secret weapon, that go-to problem-solving guide, it is the scientific method. And guess what? It's not some scary, overly complicated monster. It's really just a series of straightforward steps, a logical path your brain is actually pretty good at following naturally. Seriously, you've been using it instinctively for years. Today, we're going to break it down, see how it pops up in your daily life, and then show you how those exact same steps are used to tackle the world's biggest questions. The scientific method, step by step, life by life. At its core, the scientific method is just a systematic way to ask questions and find answers. You might see the steps listed a bit differently from place to place, but the heart of it is always the same. Let's walk through them. This is ground zero. You just notice something. Everyday example. You walk into your living room and spot your favorite house plant. Yesterday it was all perky and green, but today it's droopy and its leaves have a yellowish tint. That's an observation. Scientific example. A biologist checking on a coral reef sees that corals in one area, which used to be vibrant, are now losing their color. That's coral bleaching. What you notice naturally makes you wonder. You want to know why or how. Everyday example. Huh, why is my plant suddenly looking so sad and yellow? Scientific example, what specific things in the environment are causing the coral to bleach in this part of the reef? Do background research gathering intel. Before you jump to any wild guesses, you try to get a little more info. Everyday example, you might quickly Google causes of yellowing leaves on your plant's type. Or rack your brain. Did you water it more? Less? Is it near a drafty window? Scientific example, the biologist would look up existing research on coral bleaching, checking out studies on water temperature, pollution, ocean acidity, and sunlight in similar reef systems. They'd also look at past data for their specific reef, formulate a hypothesis, this is your best guess and explanation you can actually test. It often sounds like an if-then statement. Everyday example, okay, if my plant isn't getting enough water, then Giving it a good drink should make it perk up and get its green color back. Scientific example. If hotter sea surface temperatures are the main reason for the coral bleaching we're seeing, then the parts of the reef with consistently higher temperatures should show worse bleaching. Test the hypothesis. Experimentation time. 
now you actually try out your hypothesis. This means trying to change just one thing at a time, if you can, to see if it does what you predicted. Everyday example, you give your plant a thorough watering. You try to keep everything else, like sunlight and room temperature, the same. Then you wait and see what happens over the next day or two. Scientific example, the biologist might put out sensors to measure water temperature at different spots on the reef, comparing bleached areas to healthy ones. Or they might do controlled experiments in a lab, exposing bits of coral to different temperatures while keeping everything else the same, just to see what happens. Analyze the result, you take a good look at what happened during your test. Did things go the way you thought they would? Everyday example, after a day you check your plant. Are the leaves less droopy? Is the yellow fading? Or does it look the same, maybe even worse? Scientific example, the biologist looks at all the temperature data and how severe the bleaching is in those areas. They might use stats to see if there's a real significant link between higher temperatures and more bleaching. Draw a conclusion based on your analysis. You decide if your guess was on the right track or not. Everyday example, if the plant perked up bingo. Your hypothesis, it just needed water, looks good. If it didn't, your hypothesis wasn't supported and it's back to the drawing board. Maybe it's too much sun, pests, not enough food. This is where you might try a new guess based on what you just learned. Scientific example, if the data clearly shows that higher temperatures go hand in hand with bleaching, the hypothesis is supported. If not, or if other things seem more important, the hypothesis might be tossed out or tweaked, leading to new questions and more experiments. Science is often a cycle. Communicate results, sharing is caring. In formal science, this means publishing papers or talking at conferences. In everyday life, it's usually a bit more casual. Everyday example, you tell your friend, my phone was looking terrible, but it turns out I just wasn't watering it enough or tried watering it, no luck. Now I'm thinking it might be spider mites. Scientific example, the biologist writes up a detailed paper about their methods, data, analysis and conclusions. They send it off to be checked by other scientists, that's peer review, and hopefully published in a journal so others can learn from it, try to repeat it or build on it. See, the basic thinking is the same. Whether you're dealing with a sad houseplant or a struggling coral reef, you're observing, questioning, guessing, testing and figuring things out. Everyday science in action, more than you think. Let's peek at a few more common situations where you're totally being a scientist without even needing a lab coat. The case of the faulty pen. We've all been there, right? Observation. Your go-to pen suddenly stops writing. Question. Why isn't this thing working? Hypothesis 1. Maybe it's out of ink. And test. You try to unscrew it and peek at the ink cartridge. Analyze conclude. Nope, ink cartridge is full. Hypothesis 1 is a bust. Hypothesis 2. Maybe the tip is clogged with dried ink. You scribble like mad on some scrap paper or try wiping the tip. Analyze, conclude, aha, the ink starts flowing. Hypothesis 2 for the win. You just did a mini science experiment. Mark the culinary conundrum, kitchen fixes. You're baking cookies and they come out flat as frisbees instead of chewy and delightful. Observation. Cookies are flat, definitely not like the picture in the recipe. Question, what went wrong? Why are my cookies so sad? Background research. You quickly double check the recipe. Did you forget something? Are there any notes about common baking fails? You might vaguely remember a TV chef saying old baking soda can make things fall flat. Hypothesis. Maybe my baking soda is past its prime and isn't giving them any lift. Test for next time. You buy fresh baking soda and whip up another batch, keeping everything else the same. Analyze conclude. The new batch with fresh baking soda puffs up beautifully. Your hypothesis was right. You've scientifically upgraded your cookie game. Tech troubleshooting tango. Your Wi-Fi suddenly dies. The horror! No internet. Panic stations. Why isn't the Wi-Fi working? Hypothesis 1. Maybe the router just needs a good old reset. You unplug the router, count to 30, maybe hum a little tune, and plug it back in. The lights blink back on, your devices reconnect. Sweet relief. Hypothesis 1 was correct. The classic turn it off and on again is often a tiny successful experiment. If it hadn't worked, you'd be on to hypothesis 2. Maybe a cable is loose and you'd test that and so on. From figuring out the quickest road to work, to dodge traffic, to tweaking your golf swing for a better shot or even trying to get your sourdough starter to bubble. These are all little scientific investigations. You're noticing things, coming up with ideas, trying them out and learning from what happens. 
bridging the gap. Yes, you are a scientist. The really cool part is that this way of thinking we've just walked through, it's exactly what professional scientists use. The main differences are just the complexity of the questions, how strict the experiments are, the fancy tools they use, and the fact they often work in big teams. A scientist testing a new vaccine and you trying to figure out why your bread didn't rise are both at a basic level following these same steps of the scientific method. They might use super-powered microscopes, giant computers and run studies with thousands of people. But their journey still starts with noticing something and asking a question just like yours does. All that lab equipment, the complicated jargon, the years of specialized training, those things are all built on top of this fundamental way of investigating. They don't replace it, they just make it more powerful. So when the title says, you won't believe how you use it, the surprise isn't really that you can use it, but that you already do, all the time. Being a scientist isn't just about having a PhD or working in a lab with bubbling beakers. It's about a mindset, being curious, asking questions, looking for evidence, and being okay with testing your ideas and even changing your mind based on what you find out. Every time you troubleshoot, every time you experiment in the kitchen, Every time you try a different way to solve a problem based on what you've seen, you're thinking like a scientist. The power of this thinking, beyond daily fixes. Getting comfortable with consciously using the scientific method in your daily life offers perks that go way beyond just fixing a leaky tap or baking a better loaf of bread. It's really about sharpening your critical thinking skills. When you approach problems in this step-by-step -step way, you're less likely to just jump to conclusions or get fooled by your own assumptions or biases. You learn to look for actual evidence. You get better at checking out claims, whether they're from an ad, a news story, or even a well-meaning friend. You start asking, okay, but what's the evidence for that? How do they know? This kind of thinking helps you make smarter decisions in all parts of your life, from choices about your health, to managing your finances, to understanding tricky things happening in the world. It makes you a better learner. Because learning itself is all about discovering, testing and tweaking your understanding. It can even boost your creativity. Because coming up with a good hypothesis often means thinking a little differently. The scientific method encourages a mindset of always learning and adapting. If one idea doesn't pan out, you don't just throw your hands up. You figure out why, come up with a new idea and try again. That's resilience. That's innovation. And that's a skill that's incredibly valuable, no matter what you do. Conclusion and recap. So you see, the scientific method isn't some old, dusty thing from your school science class. It's a lively, powerful and super relevant tool that you've actually been using all along, even if you didn't call it that. It's the bridge between your everyday problem solving and the huge discoveries that shape our world. From noticing a pen that won't write to the complicated experiments that unravel the secrets of the universe, the basic ideas are the same. You observe. You question. You make a guess. You test it. You see what happened. You figure it out and you learn. You are pretty much an everyday scientist. So own it. What everyday problems have you solved using these steps? Maybe without even realizing you were doing science. Share your stories in the comments below. I'd love to read them. If this video shed some light on things and made you see your own problem solving skills in a new way, please give it a thumbs up. And if you missed the scientific method and everyday science part one, where we briefly mentioned the topic of part one, e.g talked more about why this way of thinking is so important today. You can find a link to it in the description. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on more videos exploring the science that's all around us and even within us. Thanks for watching and keep thinking like a scientist.